Welcome back to the Jungle Histology online training series. My name is Ken Langenecker and this is the third of nine modules designed to teach anybody who's interested how to perform the methods my colleagues and I use to conduct rapid reproductive analysis on reef fishes. The topic of this module is whole specimen processing. If you watched the second module, you've already seen a brief overview of whole specimen processing. But I'm going to spend a lot more time on it today because if this aspect of the work is not done properly, the remainder of your work will yield no or incorrect results. During the whole specimen processing, you'll be filling out data sheets that look something like this. The information that you gather will complete the five columns on the left side of this sheet. This can be messy work. You want to be sure that your data sheets don't fall apart because they've gotten wet. You also want to be sure that you don't lose the data that you've written on them because you've spilled alcohol or something like that onto the data sheet, which can wash away ink. So two things you need to do are be sure that the data sheets are printed on some sort of waterproof paper and record your data in archival ink or with pencil. And every time you begin a new data sheet, you want to be sure to record the study species name at the space provided at the top left of that sheet. One of the most important points I'm going to make today is that these steps should be done as soon as possible after catching or capturing a fish. The reason is that I'm assuming that you're working in a tropical environment and that you have no means of refrigeration. In this situation, fish are going to rot quickly. What you need to do is get the gonads out of the fish and fix them or stop that rotting process such that you can analyze the tissues later on. The first thing you'll do is record the specimen number on the data sheet. We just number them sequentially starting with one. After you remove the gonad from the fish, there's a whole series of processes that you're going to expose it to. You're going to fix it. You're going to weigh it. You're going to chop it into smaller pieces. You're going to transfer it through a series of solutions. You're going to put it in plastic and chop it up and put it onto a slide. What you need is a way to keep track of that specimen so that each time you get to a point where you're going to gather data, you know where to enter that data on the data sheet. The way that you're going to keep track of that little tiny gonad specimen is by creating a special specimen tag. First, you'll cut out a piece of paper about two centimeters tall and two and a half centimeters wide. Then part way up about two or three millimeters, you'll make a partial cut along that tag. Next, you'll write the code for the specimen on the big and small portion of the specimen tag. We like to use the first letters of the genus and species name followed by the specimen number. These specimen tags are really abused during the jungle histology process, so you want to be sure that they're made out of heavy paper. We use waterproof paper, or if that's hard for you to find, you can use 100% cotton paper. And just as for the data sheets, you want to record the specimen code with archival ink or with pencil. Now let's take a look at a short video showing that specimen tag creation process. Just take a piece of archival paper, about two centimeters by two and a half centimeters. Cut about a one millimeter strip along the bottom and write your specimen number on both parts of that tab. Here we're working with the first specimen of the year for Antiparadon leucogrammicus, so we call it AL1. Next, you're going to go back to the data sheet and record the date. Now, I want to emphasize here that this is the date that the fish was caught or captured. Hopefully your capture and processing date are going to be the same, but if for some reason they're not, make sure that you're recording the date that the fish was captured. And just so you understand the consequences of failing to record the date, if you don't put it on there, you won't be able to analyze spawning seasonality. Next, you'll measure and record the specimen's length. And failing to do this would have profound consequences because we use length to calculate almost every bit of reproductive information that we're trying to generate. The first step in measuring your fish is to be sure the mouth is closed. This is because many reef fishes have highly protrusible jaws and the length of the fish would depend on whether or not the mouth is closed. And I'm going to show you an extreme example next. This is what a sling jaw wrasse looks like when its mouth is closed. And here's an individual of approximately the same size with its mouth open. Now look what happens when it extends its jaws. The length of the fish would increase by nearly 25%. We also need a way to standardize measurements no matter what the shape of the fish's tail. Our approach is to measure to the very middle of the tail's edge. 
The red arrows show where to measure for a truncate tail for the fish on the left and for a forked tail for the fish on the right. Next you'll see a short video showing that length measuring process. Here's an example. We close the mouth, align the front of the head with the zero mark on the ruler or the tape measure, and then measure to the middle of the edge of the tail. It's Here's another example. Mouth is closed. Front of the head's at the beginning of the ruler. And no matter what the shape, we measure to the middle of the tail edge. The next step is to measure and record the specimen's weight. This information is used to describe the length-weight relationship for a species. We have a small selection of handheld spring scales for this task. And to increase the precision of our measurements, what we do is choose the smallest of those scales that can weigh the fish. Next you'll see a short video showing the weighing process. We have a variety of hanging spring scales and to increase the precision of the measurement we use the smallest capacity scale that will hold the specimen. The next step is to remove the gonads and the best way to demonstrate that process is with the short video coming up next. Begin by inserting one tip of some sharp scissors into the vent. Then make a very shallow cut up towards the head. You'll need to use a little bit of extra force to cut the bones between the fins. And you can stop cutting when you reach the area between the gill plates. Turn the fish around, then pry open the belly and move the digestive organs out of your way. You see? Finally, spend as much time as you need to remove the gonads from a body cavity. A good landmark you can use to find the gonads is the vent where you started cutting open the belly. The paired gametes merge near the vent and it's through the vent that sperm or eggs are released into the water. So looking forward towards the head from the vent, what you'll see is a pair of structures running on either side of the spine and held in place by clear connective tissue. Just free those gonads from the connective tissue to remove them from the fish. I'm going to let the video run through two more examples of this process. What I'd like you to do now is review the steps and then recognize that that process is the same no matter what species you're going to be looking at. You can see that this process of freeing the gonads from the connective tissue can be a lengthy process, but many people feel most comfortable removing them this way. If you want to try a different way that's a lot faster, you can take a stout pair of forceps, grab the gonads where they merge near the vent, and gently pull forward towards the head. This will allow you to remove the gonads all in one piece.
When we've cut open the fish and seen the gonads, what we like to do is record what we think the sex and reproductive state of that specimen is. Now this isn't such crucial information, but it can be used for an interesting comparison of the results between visual and histological reproductive analysis. We use five abbreviations to describe the gonads. UD means undifferentiated, or that the gonads are so small that we simply can't tell whether it's a male or a female. Then we have IF for immature female, and F for mature female. IM and M mean immature male and mature male, respectively. If you're not used to looking at fish gonads, here's a short guide to help you decide whether you have a male or a female. Testes tend to be triangular in cross-section and have a creamy white color. The cross-section of an ovary tends to be round, and the color of that organ would be yellowish. The last step to process your whole specimens is to fix the gonads, or stop those processes that would cause the gonads to rot. You're going to take a specimen bag, and in that bag you will put the specimen tag, the gonad, and a liquid fixative. I will reiterate this in the short video coming up next, but you do need to have an appropriate quantity of fixative in order for that liquid to do its job. The appropriate amount is about 10 times the volume of the gonad. Let's watch a short video of that gonad fixing process now. Add your specimen tag to the bag. Add the gonads to the bag. and add a fixative to the bag. Let's go through that process a couple more times. The job of that fixative is to keep the gonads from rotting, so you can store them without refrigeration and come back and analyze them later on. Now for that fixative to do a good job, you'll need to add to the bag a volume of fixative equal to about 10 times the size of the gonads. And finally, you'll close the specimen bag and allow the gonads to sit in the fixative for at least 24 hours. The fixative we like to use is called Dietrich's fixative, and here's the recipe that you would probably use if you had a well-equipped laboratory. Now there's a couple of disadvantages to using this recipe while you're in the field. One is that you've got chemical safety issues in carrying around glacial acetic acid. The other is that these quantities are so small that you're going to need some specialized measuring devices. We modified that recipe for use in the field. The first thing we did was replace the glacial acetic acid with white vinegar. The second thing is that we measure by parts. That is, you can take any container that will hold liquid and fill it up six times with water, fill it up two times with ethanol, fill it up one time with the formaldehyde solution, and then fill it up one time with distilled white vinegar. Add all those together and you've got your modified Dietrich solution. This concludes Module 3. I'd like to take a moment now to thank our funders.